Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Glad you're here to join us. We're planning on just worshiping the Lord, singing praises to his holy name because God is awesome, right? Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've given us new life in Christ and that uh, we can count on your love enduring forever. And it's like this song talks about, we're going to sing praises to you forever. And uh, we just want to bless you, Lord, and seek your face. Fill us with the Holy Spirit and help us to sing your praises. In Jesus' name we pray. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good above all things his love endures forever sing praise sing praise with mighty hand and outstretched arm his love endures forever for the life that's been Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is setting sun his love endures forever by the grace of God he will carry on his love endures forever sing praise sing praise sing His love endures forever. 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 His love
gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west oh, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us praise the gracious. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. If you want to sit down, go ahead, or you can just keep on and standing. Raise your hands, whatever. You can even wiggle around a little bit if you want to. When the stars burn down and the earth wears out and we stand before the throne with the witnesses who have gone before, we will rise 
and all applaud. Sing it out to him. Singing blessing and honor and glory and power forever to our God. Singing blessing and honor and glory and power forever to our God. Standing face to face in a moment will be like he. He will wipe our eyes dry and take us up to his side, and forever we will be his. Singing, blessing, and honor. been my wife and my our prayer all the stuff that's been going on with her it's like <laughs> every every day it's like lord i need you lord i need you and uh, i guess this song the matt mauer song talks about that um to be honest we're gonna be frogging out a little bit in the beginning because it's low <laughs> you I thought 
is Christ in me. Stand out for you. Oh Jesus, you're my hope and hope and Okay, junior high and high school are dismissed. <clears throat> How much do you need the Lord? <laughs> Always, amen, amen. It's just good to be reminded in worship where we stand and how much the Lord has taken us out of the darkness and brought us into his glorious light you guys need bibles raise your hands we are in the book of colossians let's pray lord thank you god for the fact that god we desperately need you lord thank you for the fact that we can gather together with with corporate knowledge that god we need you and Lord, as we come before you, may you meet us. As we open up your word, Lord God, may it speak to us. May it convict us where we need conviction. May it encourage us where we need encouragement, Lord. May it strengthen us where we need strength. May it give us the wisdom that we don't have. And Lord, may we lay aside the cares and concerns of the day and of the week and what's next in front of us. And may we lay that at your feet, Lord. And God, we thank you for your hand in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you've never given up on us. Lord, we thank you that you've always taught us no matter what, that you've always been there no matter what, that, Lord, you have proven faithful, and you will continue to prove faithful, and, Lord, you are faithful. So, Father, we give you this time in the Word and ask God that you join us. Holy Spirit, may you teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do encourage you guys next Sunday evening just to come and just uh, prayer and worship. It's amazing how God can move when we wait upon him. There's something in the Bible about it, but I don't know where that's at. All right. 
We have the book of Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 9. It says this, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through the blood for forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is beginning, who is the beginning, the firstborn from, de from the dead, that, it may, that in all things he may have the preeminence. you got to know this. Paul is writing from a prison to encourage and to let this church know that they're noticed. It's a long ways away. This is a, a church in Colossae. A long way away. That they are noticed and that they are appreciated. And that they are prayed for. And that they are lifted up. That they are part of a mighty movement of God that was going all throughout the Roman Empire. The Gentiles were being saved. Gentile churches were being established. That God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there's a place for the, for the, the, the Gentile. There always has been a place for the stranger. So he's encouraging these people. And this movement is breaking out all over. The power of the Spirit is upon so many. Ch lives are changed. The world is being reached all because of one person at a time being reached. These people in their community shedding the light of the gospel because the reason they were listened to is because their lives reflected it. And it's the same today. But we have this template. We have this to go on with. Now here's Paul. He's now imprisoned. As a matter of fact, he is uh, not sure what's going to happen. But he has the ability to encourage and pour into this church this amazing letter. And when they got it, you know, mail was a little slow back then. <laughs> Not real reliable. But when they got this letter, the depth of it moved them. Because here's the thing. This letter was exactly what they needed exactly at the right time. And that's another thing. God is pretty timely. He has a way of reaching us when we need reached. He has a way of getting our attention when we need to get uh, show up for what he wants for us. And in reading this letter to the church for the first time, it had to have been enlightening. There's such depth here. And copied and circulated, it is a powerful letter of encouragement. It didn't just stay there. This was scripture. This was inspiration by the Holy Spirit that Paul wrote to this church. As I talked last week, Colossae is under ruin. We don't, it's, it's buried long gone, but this letter's not. This church had, had an impact on, in many respects, on the future of the church going forward. It's Christianity 101. It says that since they heard of them, since Paul heard of them, because their founder was with, in prison with Paul also, 
But he, since, we, since we heard from you, we do not cease to pray. Why is Paul saying we do not cease to pray? A lot of times as a Christian, we learn how to not to cease to pray. How do we learn that? By when we cease to pray. Things kind of fall apart. When we remember, when we are reactionary and jump into stuff before we pray because it seems right. We learn the depth of prayer. We learn the ability of praying. We learn that God hears us and we also know this. We can get God's attention by praying. You have not because you ask not. And this has nothing to do with, it does in some degree, material possessions, but it has everything to do with, Lord, I want to give you this part of me. Lord, I ask that you lead me here. Lord, give me patience. Lord, let me be a better witness. All of these things that we realize, I need him. Oh, how I need him. Every hour I need him. And so many times we have this ability to kind of forget to pray. We have this propensity to react first and pray later. We went through David and, and all of 1 and 2 Samuel, a template for that. It's all through the word. This is, this is us in the flesh. These are the things that as we recognize, Lord, I need you. So here is Paul. We do not cease to pray for you because Paul knows that prayer is the key. For this church to start making an impact on this Gentile city, this Roman city, for this church to do so, it's going to get attacked. Leadership will get attacked. Those, those that are going forward will get attacked. There's going to be such distraction because that's what the devil does. We haven't ceased to pray for you guys, and we want you to know this. Because... When you step forward here, when any of us to get on the enemy's radar, in order for them to stand, in order for them to stay effective and viable, they corporately need to pray. In order for a church to grow and become viable, is the fact we need him. And it's amazing how times they are a changing. And it's amazing how I have learned and, and have desired and, and have been driven by many respects to pray more. We're going on past two years of us guys just meeting on Saturdays praying. I can't tell you what I've learned. God is faithful. Paul's prayer is this, that they do corporately ask God, that they do in every respect are, are ready for him to work in their lives. Because so, as he tells them, for this reason we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and in spiritual understanding. This is Paul. They, he wants them to be filled with spiritual understanding, to be liberally supplied with knowledge of his will. What does that take? That doesn't just happen. That doesn't happen by taking this and going to sleep and you think maybe somehow it will get in there. It don't work that way. It works by waiting upon him. It works by meditating upon his word. It works by recognizing the, the a power of his word. And to have a high regard for his word. The inerrancy of his word. And when you realize this is key, this is important for me as a believer to go forward. This is important for me as a believer to be effective. Paul says, I'm praying for this for you guys. This takes work. This takes study. This is development of disciplines. See, disciplines can be this. When you realize this is good for me, when you realize this is also in many respects strengthens me, this is something that I want to make a part of who I am. Legalism goes so far and then there's no power there. But when I know that I need this, oh, how I need this, then this is the part where God meets me. There was a time in my life where I'm like, you know, I'm not reading my Bible 
I'm, 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 I'm not backsliding. I'm not being disciplined. I need to put myself in a place where I'm accountable, put my place where, uh, self where, where I can get into a Bible study. And this is the beginning. Because that's where God starts is we realize, I need him. And I need to do this, and I'm not doing it out of any reason, but I finally come to the conclusion that I need to stay in his word. In order to do so, I need to make myself accountable. So he says this. In recognizing the transformation that we have in Christ. And this is training. And this is the whole part. For this reason, we also, since the day that we heard of it, do not cease to pray that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in, the, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. If I may, because here is Romans, it's so simple, here, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. The book of Romans has already been out. He had been out for about the letter to the Romans about four or so years. Availability, what, what, what Paul put together here is, is a masterpiece. But he's telling them because that we present ourselves to the Lord. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And as we do so, and if and when you do this on a consistent basis, presenting myself before the Lord in prayer, opening up his word, and so whatever I can learn here, things start to happen to you. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transferred by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As we take this source of knowledge and set it aside because when I was in the world that didn't do me a lot of good the way the world thinks but when I got a hold of God's word it changed everything conform oneself to another pattern is what that means to transform to change to another form the spirit is doing it the word will sink deeply into your heart and into who you are and you will be able to know what God's will is in your life. Growing in Christ is a lifelong process. Because when the word transforms us, the things that I used to think, I no longer think. The way I used to walk, I no longer walk. And we are to walk worthy. That you may walk worthy fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. As we build on this, it's amazing how we can change because of time spent with him. It's amazing how we can change by the encouragement that you get from your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's amazing how they can bring a perspective that you need to hear. It's amazing what fellowship does for us. It's amazing what prayer does for us. application of his word so that we can walk worthy by obedience willful obedience because i don't know about you but but i have learned a lot in life by lack of discipline yeah, yeah. and i think you guys are, are made of the same stuff we can get lazy we can just get i'll do it tomorrow we can say you know Praying would be great, but one more bowl of ice cream would be better. <laughs> and you do it. Pretty soon, 
you realize, you know what? It just made me feel worse. There's seasons where I followed an easy path, which is called the least resistance. Why is it hard to open up your Bible? Why is it hard to pray? Why? Because things happen to you when you do. Things that in many respect equip you to be effective for the kingdom of heaven. I can't do it. But I can show up and he will do it. When we're there, maybe we don't backslide or fall into to elicit sin, but I just know that we don't grow much. And your prayers are just quick ones for when you eat. And sometimes there's, there's that whole part where we're not that much encouragement for anybody else around us either. And you all know the dry seasons. We all have been through them. And you, you reflect as God has reached you once again and, 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 and dusts you off and encourages you. As you make the move to him first, it's always this in Scripture, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. As we draw close to him, say, Lord, you've really got my attention. I, I, I want to focus on you more. I want to open your word and he'll speak to you. He just does. God can get our attention. And he can gently nudge us back into action. Gently nudge us back into application and appreciation of consistent fellowship with him and with others. You get some years behind you. You get some seasons where there's, this happens and that. We do learn and grow in Christ. And so many times we learn from mistakes. And so many times we are encouraged by the victories that God's given us. And because of where he's taken us sometimes from our mistakes and put us here, he can keep us humble that way. Because it's not my idea. It's my idea of saying, Lord, I can't do it. Help me. And he does. And God can get our attention. He will get your attention in no other way because he knows you all. You know, my head's about that thick, you know, and it takes a while to, to get through. But he will get through. Why? Because he loves us. He wants fellowship with us. And in doing that, in that fellowship, I hear him. He speaks to me. Because it's my sheep hear my voice. I am familiar with the presence of God in prayer. I am familiar in many respects how sometimes when I am looking, or, or not even that, or sometimes where I am just reading, all of a sudden here's this scripture that jumps out and just absolutely is exactly what I needed. And it righted it all. Because his word is powerful and sharp as a two-edged sword. In order to buy, it goes in deep with us. And it changes our hearts, our minds, and our direction. So that's what Paul is talking about to these guys. That you walk worthy, fully pleasing him. You walk in humility, fully pleasing him. In doing so. Because you can walk worthy when you're out, you know, walking about and you're presenting your Christian face, you know. But you're not walking worthy at home. If you're walking worthy at home, you are presenting something on the outside. It's because you've spent time with him. As we walk worthy, as we recognize, hey, the more time I spend to him, the more I'm being changed. Fully pleasing him. Being fruitful. In every good work. And when we do this, when we are honestly knowing every day, God, I need you. Every day, God, I, I need you. 
I'm doing this because I know I need to do this. Because I know how quickly I can unravel if I don't let you keep me held together. They say a tattered Bible. I just dropped stuff out of my tattered keeps your life together. You know, I don't want to be a litter bug. All right. Here's the thing. It, what holds us together is his word. What holds us together is know who you are in Christ and the amazing cost of your salvation. What holds us together is the fact that he, He's never left us nor forsaken us. And he never will to the end of the age. What holds us together, I don't have to walk in fear. I walk in hope as a believer. And to know this, and to represent this, and this is part of your countenance, people will see the, the, the confidence that you have, and you say it's all in him. They'll ask you for the hope that lies within. It's because you are walking worthy. And you're doing it in a genuine, reflective aspect of this is what it looks like to trust God. The world doesn't know that. The world has no idea, but we are a peculiar people because we have a constitution that God put in us. Being fruitful. You may walk worthy and we're fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Gee, it's amazing how you can increase in the knowledge of God when you walk with him. You can increase in the, in the recognition of the Spirit of God as you are walking with Him. And pleasing Him because He's so good. In every good work, as you increase in the knowledge of God, this is 101, just spiritual growth. This is going past being a baby in Christ. This goes into walking with Him. This goes into so many different levels. Strengthen with all might, he says. Verse 11, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for patience and long-suffering with joy. Strengthen with all might. That's, this, that's what relationship with Christ looks like. This is their prayer for this church. This is Paul's prayer for the Colossian church according to his glorious power. That as life unfolds, that as trials keep coming, because they will. One thing Jesus promised is you'll, you'll suffer tribulation. The thing is, you used to suffer tribulation and you had nowhere to go with it, but to the inner sanctuaries of whatever you had, but we suffer persecution, we suffer tribulation, and we have somewhere to take our cares and concerns and our burdens. And he meets us right there. As life unfolds, as trials keep coming, they have God-given patience. God gives us the patience. It is a fruit of the Spirit. Obtained by application and God's proven track record. There is patience there. Where did that come from? It came from trusting in him. It came from walking by faith. It came from all these things. You can't conjure up God-given patience. I, my patience goes so far. But God can give me patience that goes so much farther. There are days I can stand in any line. And there are other days, like, I wish that lady would stop fumbling. You know, it's all those things, because I'm in a hurry, you know. But we can do this. God can do anything. He can give us a patience. He can give us understanding. He can do that. And he can give us joy in it all. Joy in suffering. Joy in trials. Another fruit of the Spirit. See, I like to be happy. The world uses happy all the time. Happy is so temporal. I'm happy because I got a new car. But I would like to have another color. <laughs> you know, I'm not as happy as I should be, but 
The joy of the Lord is my strength. I can be joyful in a trial. Count it all joy when you face trials, of various trials. How can I do that? I'm telling you what. There's trials I've had that I don't want to repeat. I would never want to repeat them. They were hard won and hard fought. But what I learned and what I have from that trial is priceless. And I can use that and draw from that to keep myself looking towards him or to draw from that to say this is what God did for me because our historical aspect of showing up for him is to be poured out into one another. It is so cool to see progress in our Christian walk. It is so cool to see where, where God has taken you from day one. And it's so cool to know he's not given up. It's just begun. You'll never even be bored in heaven. He's got so much for us, more than we realize. There's all over scripture where Paul says, you could have been here, but you haven't. I know every one of us because we could be farther in our walk. Yes, yes, yes. But I'm glad that God's been patient with me. I'm glad that he's never given up on me. I'm glad he's like just waiting. Okay, I'm waiting. When you get stuff looking out, this, out the window, you know, we'll talk some more. <laughs> and verse 12 says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. We have so great a salvation. We're qualified by faith. We're kept by faith in him. And we're kept through it all. As we abide in him. Our inheritance as sons. Here's this Gentile church. And he's telling them as you guys abide in him. He will abide in you. He will make into, it, you into the man you can never be and into the woman you can never be. Into the mom, the dad, the co-worker, all those things. That's what he does. He does a good job of it. Verse 13 says, And he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. He's delivered us. which this word means to draw to oneself. He is the deliverer. He's drawn us to himself. He has redeemed us. He has spoken to us. I am no longer a slave to sin, but I'm a child of God. He's delivered us from sin. Remember Paul's letter to the Romans. He could have, and it, it reached them that they were delivered. I just want to read to you Romans 1, 6, 1 through 14 real quick. What shall I say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. 
For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive in God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that, they should, that you should obey it and its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. I'm no longer a slave to sin. There was things I used to do, and I had no conviction over it whatsoever. But when I found Christ, it changed it all. Totally changed it all. And he equipped me. There's things I can choose not to do where before I had no conviction over whatsoever. Because that's the whole part. Going back to 14, in whom we have redemption through, the, through his blood for the forgiveness of sins. This is our identity. That we are redeemed. We are redeemed. How? By his blood. I can't do any of this on my own. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And these are things I can grow in Christ because he strengthens me. I am strengthened by him because I show up and let him strengthen me. These are the simplicities of just growing in Christ. We are forgiven our sins because of the cross. And this is what Paul wants to establish with these guys also. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. They're firstborn over all creation. So he is going to break down to them who Jesus is and what he's all about. And the fact that we have a personal relationship with him as believers. As you just take this in, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. All of God's attributes were evident in Jesus. He was fully God and fully man. Jesus said this, if you have seen him, you have seen God. John 10, 30 says, I and the Father are one. John 10, 30 said, 10, 38 says, believe the works that you know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. John 12, 45, and he, and he who sees me and, and he who sees me sees him who sent me. We have all these references. I mean, the book of John is the book, this is Jesus is God. It's all through that, the establishment of that. The fact of, of what that looks like. He's reminding these guys. 16 and 17 goes forward, keeps going. It says, for by him, talking about Jesus... All things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He created all things. The Holy Spirit's revealing this, and as Paul relays this to them, the reason being to combat the paganism that, that the Gentile churches had to deal with, the Gnosticism, all these things, that Jesus was sinful, all these, there were so many different, but he's establishing something very powerful, something that's, that's deep, 
I mean, you go through the Old Testament, there's so much there. And we'll get into some of this that's just amazing. And here's the part. Jesus came from heaven, not out of dust. That he is God. Paul's want, wanting these, this is fundamental. Not only that, but that in the beginning was the word. Going back to John. He was the Logos. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. All means all here, right? For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. This is Paul establishing to this church and to us and to all others that have read this that he made all things in heaven and on earth, visible or invisible. All boundaries, all parameters in heaven. Figure that out. Whether they were thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, there's detail here for a reason. There's detail here for us to recognize that so great is salvation. This sets up for us a huge application of our Lord. Because he said, I created all things. And we're dealing with heaven and the boundaries of heaven. A huge application. The angelic abode where the angels dwell. Created by him. All of heaven's majesty created by him. All of the angelic order that he put into play in the heavenlies, bigger than us, created by him. Whether invisible from us, there's things we don't see on the spiritual realm here. The depth of heaven. It'll be a great place. But he is just giving this church and us the, the, the great salvation that we are, that, that God has given us, that we are partakers of. There's sub, such substance here under the whole other parameters of, of boundaries that God has set. And which Satan violated. Then this is I mean, I can't even wrap my head around that part. Then he says the heavens and then the earth, all of its boundaries, all of its parameters, all of its principles, all the principalities there, which Satan also violated. That we have the earth mentioned with its laws and its physics and its beauty. You know, it's, it's so many people, when you, when you just walk out in a forest, walk out in the desert, just experiencing God's amazing creation, it is awe-inspiring. The fact is that the Bible tells us that eternity is in our hearts. As we have come so far with our DNA, come so far with no such thing as a simple cell, come so far with all these things, we see this thing. The intricacy, the, 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 the code of DNA. This just unravels, and it continues to unravel or, or reveal itself to, the, to how we are fearfully and wonderfully made because his signature is on everything, and we've just kind of stumbled into that the last 50 years. It's on everything, undeniable. And all of these things is by the speaking of the word. Thrones and dimensions. How inspiring, what, what a visual, what a huge, huge exclamation point. That he is above all things and he established all means all. It's a big all. Clear down to the atoms. The neutrons and protons. Even smaller, 
or those particles that are in the atom. We don't know. Science still doesn't know what holds this stuff together. They got strange, weird charges that they should be... It's all of this. You take your finger off of that. We've messed with it before. When you mess with atoms, bad things happen. He holds all things together. It's that whole thing. Nobody can understand how these things just continue to orbit. But here's the thing. When God made the earth, here is the, the commune that he had. In Genesis 1.26 says this, let us make man in our image. The triune God spoke and communed and come to the aspect of making man in his image. All of these things, God, Paul wasn't a nuclear physicist, you know? And all this builds our faith. Imagine this letter given to this church. Nobody even grabbed these words until now. And where they do make sense, he holds all things together. Physically, it shouldn't be that way. The math doesn't work very well that he holds all things together. It can't be explained. And it says, he is the head of the church, the body who is the beginning, verse 15, the firstborn from all the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. He is the head. And so that's the whole part. It's such a high application that as we realize that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, that my very DNA is as unique and so is yours, that I'm held together because he holds us together. That we are the firstborn from the dead. And that's what he did for us. He is the head, the body of the church. He says we are the ecclesia. We are the called out ones. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The firstborn from the dead. And now it goes into this. That's what he did for us. Because of the res resurrection... that all things that he may have preeminence, we give him the glory and honor and praise. He holds our place in heaven because of what he did. He established our right standing with God because God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. He came and dwelt among us and put all that and he became a man. He became frail. He lived in our parameters. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He cried out to God. Everything he did was because he had communion with God. He paved such a way for us. He loves us with an undying love. And Paul wanted this church to really recognize this aspect. And he holds our place in heaven, established by our right standing. And here we kind of go into this. For verse 19, because it, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and that by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth, or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross, that you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you, to present me, holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. We opened up this, this teaching with prayer in Jesus' name. We can enter the throne room of God because of the Lamb of God. 
If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, that we and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Satan was defeated at Calvary on his claim on us. And it was totally paid for. The second Adam, Jesus the man, paid it all. And you, as he's telling this Gentile church, in verse 21 and 22, and you, who once were alienated, totally alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled you, first to the Jew and then for the Gentile. This is the good news for us. This is where it starts. This is the thing. This is where it just went all over the world. And we are a recipient of this because somebody told somebody who told somebody who kept on telling somebody. A chain will be fun, but not right now. If indeed you continue in the faith, this is the stuff. Continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast. We need to be grounded and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached in, to every creature under heaven, which I, Paul, am a minister. And you, church, he's reconciled your account as well. What do I do with that? What do you do with that? As we abide in him, just going from the, from the beginning of that, abide in him as we are grounded and steadfast by faith, not moved away from the hope of the good news of Jesus Christ. And here's what he's just in every way establishing for this church. With knowledge comes power. And with applied knowledge comes wisdom. This is the simplicity of it. To know who you are, how great your salvation is, where you stand in his sight, in heaven's eyes. You can bow your knee, and in the name of Jesus, you can ask God and, and give him all these aspects. He'll hear your prayers. Applied knowledge comes wisdom, and by wisdom we discern things. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The simplicity of all of that. So in just finishing, what's our, what's our takeaways here? It's this. Prayer is key to it all. It's key to it all. And may we walk worthy. And may we walk worthy of the calling which we all have. May we walk with, with, with the intelligence of it was a great salvation that, that I can come to the Father cost so much that all of the Old Testament is just that, is God reaching down to man. And as we come to this season where we can recognize and look at what really happened in that little hill on Bethlehem, as we studied through David and he is a part of that lineage, and he established this kingdom. We have so great a salvation. Let's live like we do. Father God, we thank you for your hand. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord God, for the sobering aspect of how big you are. And how small we are. And yet, Lord, you live inside us. Lord, this is a mystery to the angels. And Lord, it is in every aspect something that I think we have a tendency to take for granted, i.e. our relationship with you. Lord, you're always there. Lord, let us never forget what it took for a relationship with you. Let us never forget that I am no longer a slave to sin, but I am a child of God. And Lord, let me, by your strength, by the knowledge of what you give me, and you give each of us the wisdom that, Lord, we glean from a consistency of just setting at your feet. May you speak to our hearts. May you strengthen us where we need strength. May you lead us where we need led. 
May you be in our midst. May we become familiar with your presence. May we become familiar with your spirit. That, Lord, we may be effective for you, for the people around us. We recognize the fact that it is always this. It is always us. It is always one person at a time sharing what we know. May we be the light that the world needs. May we recognize the fact that as we show up, Lord, you do so many amazing things in our hearts and in our lives. And so, Lord, we give you this week and ask that you use us, Lord. Give us boldness where we need it. Let us, Lord God, walk worthy because, Lord, you are worthy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right. If you guys need prayer, we will um, have it over here, I believe. So, George and Darlene. Let's stand up and praise the Lord. will testify you made the earth and sky nothing at all and everywhere that we look we see you no power on earth is beyond what you conclude you are awesome God King of Kings yeah Lord of life everything the great I am the holy lamb creator of all things mighty vortex world meet the dusty words conductor of love you're the consuming fire in your majestic voice will be heard above all. And everywhere that we look, we see you. No power on earth is beyond what you conclude. You are awesome God, King of kings, Lord of life, everything. Son in Christ, 
paid the price our life made mighty agent glowing tempest maker and our healer you are awesome god we love you and praise you and as we go throughout the rest of our week just uh, bless us with your presence lord Fill us with your spirit. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.